thank you, thank you for taking care of each other and for checking on each other and for the love you have extended. It really does make a difference. You are fulfilling the command of Jesus Christ. Do you realize that? You're not just being nice people. You are fulfilling the command of the Lord Jesus Christ. John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Thank you all for loving each other. Most of us are very familiar with that beautiful Gospel of John. Almost everybody knows Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But near the back of our Bible, close to the book of Revelation, which most people tend to know where that's at, we find 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Here in this church just a couple of years ago, we spent several weeks in the letter called 1st John. Today and next Sunday, we're going to look at the itty-bitty books of 2 John and 3 John. This itty-bitty book, 2 John, is so short, I'm actually going to ask you to stand as I read through it. 2 John, starting with verse 1, and I will be using the New King James Version this morning. The elder, to the elect lady and her children whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all those who have known the truth, because of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace be with you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. I rejoice greatly that I have found some of your children walking in truth, as we received commandment from the Father. And now I plead with you, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment to you, but that which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. This is love, that we walk according to His commandments. This is the commandment that you have heard from the beginning. You should walk in it. For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we do not lose those things we worked for, but that we may receive a full reward. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house nor greet him. For he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. Having many things to write you, I did not wish to do so with paper and ink. But I hope to come to you and speak face to face, that our joy may be full. The children of your elect sister greet you. Amen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. While the term elder was typically used in those days to mean the local leader of the local house church, here the term has a different meaning. It is used as a description of one with age and wisdom probably an apostle or someone who personally knew and represented them. It's the opinion of most scholars and the church, Big C, that this pastor of 1, 2, and 3 John were written or dictated by the apostle John, the same one that wrote the gospel of John. He spent his final years in Ephesus and the Greek Also, that's important to know here is when you see that word lady or the elect lady, it's also understood to mean the church. 
The letter itself makes it clear that when she is used, it is referring to the bride of Christ. This letter is motivated by the love of truth. It is truth that surpasses both time and place. Truth will be with us forever. Truth doesn't get changed by circumstances or situations. The fellowship of love that Christians have transcends everything else. As God loves us unconditionally, grace, mercy, and peace are extended to His children, us. Verse 4. I rejoice greatly that I have found some of your children walking in truth as we received commandment from the Father. And now I plead with you, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment to you, but that which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. This is love, that we walk according to His commandments. This is the commandment that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. I can't help but picture John kicked back or lean forward, whether he's writing or dictating, and a memory flashes through his head. The memory of a Thursday night right before the crucifixion. A memory where he was right beside Jesus. As a matter of fact, it indicates in the scriptures that he may have very well been leaning up against Jesus. And Jesus had already washed their feet and he had come to the table and he had started the Passover ceremony. And then all of a sudden Jesus says, I give you a new commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. He's washed to their feet. He's preparing them for the worst nightmare of their lives. They're about to go through. And he doesn't give them all this advice. You know, it's interesting to me that Jesus could have given them a whole bunch of advice here. But he doesn't. What he says is, I'm giving you a new command. A new commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. Then, at some point between supper time and the meal got over, and then they headed out to uh, Gethsemane to where they would spend the night. Somewhere in that time period, Jesus pulls them all together and says, If you love me, keep my commands. And, and John's words here in this itty-bitty letter remind the church of this truth. This is truth. God loves, Jesus loves, and we are to love. I mean, love like I love you? That's what Jesus said. I mean, Jesus gave his life up. Jesus had no home. He was homeless. Jesus ate whatever people gave him. Jesus got frustrated with his disciples, but he didn't run them off. And we're to love like Jesus loved. Not to mention the biggie. Cross, that's a pretty biggie. There's no torture like crucifixion. Love like I have loved you. It's also interesting here that John, once again, we got a Greek text and we're translating it to English for us. And the, the Greek here uses the word for love is agape. Agape is God love. It is a kind of love that is not based on feelings. 
It is not like the love we have for our spouses. It is not like the love we have for our children. It is not like the love we have for our parents. It is not like the love we have for our best friend. Agape love is not feelings-based. Agape love means that we choose to love that person no matter what. We choose to love them, and it doesn't mean they deserve it. We choose to love them, and it may not even get received. They may do this number. We choose to love them, and they be, may, may continue to be a meanie. I don't know. <clears throat> but it is the kind of love where we make a choice that I'm going to love them, care for them, pray for them, no matter what. Jesus served Judas. Communion. Jesus knew and he loved him. That's hard. That's hard because sometimes I want to punch people in the head. And that's on a good day. <laughs> This kind of love's hard, and we can't do it our own. We can't do it on our own. Agape love is God love. That means the Holy Spirit puts that kind of love in us, and it flows out of us. The Holy Spirit is working in us all the time. And as we mature in Christ, it will get easier. Doesn't mean it'll ever be faultless. But it means as we let God work in us, He really will do it. Sometimes we think God's not going to change. Nothing's ever going to change. What changes is on the inside of us. And our love for others can change because God's love is beginning to change us. That's the only way we can ever love like Jesus loved. This choosing to love is an act of the will. It is an act of choice. And John compliments many in the church of his day. We just read it. Because some of them were doing just that. But from the wording here, it's evident that not everybody was doing that. Not everybody in the church was practicing this agape love. They were a mess. Sometimes we get to thinking that the early church was perfect. No, the early church was not perfect. They had stuff just like we have stuff. And because some of them were not following the truth of Jesus' words, there was division and there was problems. So John calls them, and John is calling us back to the basic truth of the command of Jesus Christ. Love each other. Love one another as I have loved you. Verse 7. For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we do not lose those things we worked for, but that we may receive a full reward. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house nor greet him. For he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. Let's, uh, let's get some of the elephants out of the room. First, Antichrist here means against Christ. It's not a person that's going to rule the world. Okay, In this particular scripture... That's not what this is talking about. The other thing uh, that might be a biggie here is who is John, who's this letter to? The church. So who is this letter not about? Somebody say it louder. Come on, who's this letter not about? It's not about heathens. It's not about people who are not Christians. 
sometimes we want to apply all of this right here to people who are not Christians. Remember, if someone is not a Christian, don't expect them to be. That drives me nuts. If somebody's not a Christian, don't expect them to live like a Christian. Don't expect them to talk like a Christian. Don't expect them to behave like a Christian. Because they're not a Christian. Who John is about to really get on to were people who said they were Christians. <clears throat> now let's see what he has to say here. A couple of other things so that this little letter will make more sense. It would help us to understand that in the early days of the church, there was some organization. That if there's a mentality out there that it was just everybody each to his own, it wasn't. There was some organization. It was not staunch. It was nothing like we have today, but here's what they had. There were the apostles or disciples who were direct disciples of the apostles by this time in the history of the church. And probably by this time, John's the only one left. Those were, whatever they said went. Whatever those apostles said went. Because they had been with Jesus. And then, as I said earlier, the elders were the people who led the little local house churches. Because at this point in the church, there's no churches like we have now. Okay? And then in between the two, they had all these people, and, and there were a lot, who traveled from place to place to place. And believe me, they went all over the known world. And they called them prophets. Uh, we have a seminary graduate here. Another word for prophet? Preacher. When it's used in this context and we see the word prophet, we need to understand they're talking about these preachers that went from place to place to place to help people understand the gospel. Hear the gospel, receive the gospel, and understand the gospel. We would call them missionaries today. That, that, that's how they worked. Evangelists, missionaries, yeah, that's how they worked. While there could have been, I guess, a problem with the line of the apostles, but we know that is not so, and there were problems with some of the local pastors. We see that in some other letters in the New Testament. Here, John is dealing with those traveling preachers, evangelists, missionaries. There's a problem. You see, and I could see how, how that could become a problem. I mean, just think about it from a practical point of view. I could see where those folks would get tempted to fall into the trap of living lazy at the expense of a local congregation. You know, just go in, tell them some good words, let them feed you and house you for a few days and then go on to the next place. And some of that happened. The other temptation was to instill incorrect teaching which is what John is addressing in 2 John. That's a little piece of what you're getting when you look at this itty-bitty book of the New Testament. Some of these prophets were teaching that Jesus was not and had never been flesh. Now that sounds crazy to us. But in their day, remember these were Greek and Roman people? Remember Greek and Roman people? Greek and Roman people that believed in Zeus and Apollo and Hercules, half man, half God. So it wasn't long in the early days of the church before the idea, because Greek people believed that this is evil. No matter what happens, this flesh is evil. And everything about this flesh is evil. And that our spirits are pure. So it got really easy to begin to say, Jesus was only an apparition. 
He came, but because he's God, because he's divine, he was never really a human. There were even stories about things like when he walked, he never left footprints. There's all kinds of interesting writing out there. That's why a whole bunch of stuff's not in our Bible, because some of it's really crazy. And so why did this matter? It mattered because if Jesus was not flesh and blood, if Jesus was not 100% man, he could not represent mankind. He could not be the perfect sacrifice for our sins. And if he couldn't be the perfect sacrifice for our sins, then that meant we got to do something. We got to do something so our salvation's good enough. See how twisted it can get real quick? I think I just talked for four minutes on that subject, and I've probably got you all so confused you don't have a clue what I'm talking about. Not really. Y'all are smart people. But the reality was there were some folks out there going around doing some false teaching, and it was causing division in the church. And what was Jesus' command? Love one another as I have loved you. Fighting people don't love each other very much. Notice in this letter, unlike Jude, we did Jude last week. Wow, was that a hard one, wasn't it? I'm still reeling from Jude. John doesn't talk about behaviors at all. John is concerned that if the church doesn't have the correct view of Jesus, then everything else in life, in the church, everywhere, will be amiss. It will be askew. I tend to agree with that. What John wants them to do is go back to the very basic. Jesus is Lord. Jesus gives grace and mercy. Jesus loved us, therefore we love. Go back to the basics, folks. And sometimes I think we need to go back to the basics. Because we can get caught up in a whole bunch of stuff. Watch the news for two days in a row, and you can get caught up in a whole bunch of stuff. Now, I'm not telling you not to stay informed, not to do that. But I'm saying, remember that stuff that's passing, that stuff that's passing What's eternal? The love of Jesus Christ is eternal. The love we show others is what lives on. It's what affects people. When we grasp how high and how deep and how wide is the love of Jesus Christ, then our thoughts and our words and our actions will eventually line up and glorify Him. If we love Him, This is why John's words tend to seem so harsh when he starts talking about banishing these false teachers. The teaching that Jesus was only a spirit that looked like a human would minimize the work of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Can you imagine how upset that made John? Remember, who was the only disciple standing at the cross? John was standing close enough that he could see the blood drip down on the ground. And then somebody saying he wasn't a real human? No wonder John gets upset here. He knew that that kind of teaching would eat away at the church and it wouldn't be long until everything became works-centered instead of grace-centered. instead of love-centered, instead of mercy-centered. The Lord Jesus is to be the ruler of our lives. Therefore, his command stands. The Lord Jesus is king and master of our lives. Therefore, the command stands. Jesus Christ is our priority and what he says becomes our priority. Jesus and his words 
our truth. And thinking about that, thinking about that makes me realize how important it is to know Jesus' words. If it's been a while since you read a gospel, please go back and read a gospel. Let the words of Jesus sink into you deeply. And if you don't like reading, don't give me that excuse because most of you got a telephone that you can go th -th 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 and listen to anything you want to. And the Bible's out there, I know. Every once in a while I use it. We must know what Jesus said. How can we know truth if we don't know what Jesus said? And I don't mean picking what you like and throwing out what you don't like. We don't get to do that. That's not truth. Verse 12. Having many things to write to you, I do not wish to do so with paper and ink, but I hope to be, come to you and speak face to face that our joy, joy may be full. The children of your elect sister greet you, amen. Speak face to face that our joy may be full. It is such a wonderful gift of God to be able to communicate in all the ways we do today. Uh, take that as a gift. It, it is a gift. Now, the devil likes to take things and twist it and ruin it. But things in itself are gifts to us. But I couldn't help but wonder when I read this little, it kept, I kept coming back to it. I really hate it when I keep coming back to something and the Holy Spirit starts going blah, 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 and get my attention. But I kept coming back to this because the Holy Spirit just kept tugging at my heart with this statement in this little letter that maybe we all, me included, need to be reminded that the best way to talk things out, the best way to encourage each other, the best way to stay on track with our faith is face-to-face -face contact. Oh, brothers and sisters, please watch carefully what you believe from the media. Please. Face-to-face. Face-to-face. There's something significant in being together that helps us come to truth. Could it be, I got to thinking about this, could it be, think about it with me, these traveling preachers had no local congregation to keep them accountable. Could it be, I'm, I mean, they had no local congregation where they stayed and spent time with. They had no local congregation where they could discuss matters with. They're just out on their own taking Jesus' words and remember they're not written yet so it's all by word of mouth and making them say whatever they want them to say because there's nobody to go, oh, that doesn't sound quite right. Let's talk about that. No wonder these guys or gals, who knows, got in trouble. Have you noticed all the way through these itty bitty books of the New Testament that we've been doing, not to mention the big books, that the church is necessary for a healthy relationship with Jesus? Have you ever thought about that? Or we can get off track and start thinking what I think is truth. Now, it's possible what you think is truth if you're basing it on Jesus' words. <clears throat> but most of the time, we base it on what we think is right or what we think that scripture's saying. I believe the church of Jesus Christ God instituted the church. God put the church together. God spread the church throughout the world. God is still spreading the church throughout the world. It's a God thing. 
That's not a people thing. If you, it, when you hear that comment that the church is man-made, I'm telling you right now, that's a lie of the devil. Don't even go there. Now, do churches get askew? They do. We got one right here in 2 John that's askew. And so John is helping them get back on the track. Go back to Jesus. Go back to Jesus. Go back to Jesus. Go back to Jesus. What did Jesus say? Are you loving? He commanded. What was his command? Love one another as I have loved you. Hmm. And I'm not saying the church is necessary because I'm a preacher and I think everybody ought to go to church. But if everybody would like to come to my church all the time, I'm okay with that out there online. <laughs> These ancient words help us. They give us direction to be part of the elect lady and her children. To love and care for the bride of Christ, we really do need each other. Each other to love, each other to serve. We need each other to have accountability. Every one of us, okay, I'm going off track. Everybody, everybody needs someone close to you that you can be accountable to and that you will listen to and that you won't necessarily every time they tell you something do something different that's not accountability that's called rebellion and then here's a big one most of us will nod our heads because we can think of somebody that you know can has some accountability who's accountable to you do you know that's how discipleship is set up? Jesus set that up too. Every one of us should have somebody that's accountable to us, that we can help, that we can talk about Jesus with, that we can help guide them. Because here's the reality. I'm 60 more, and I'm going to die. And there are going to be young people in this congregation who are going to live on. I want these kids under me to hear me. And may it be ingrained in them. Jesus loves you beyond anything you can hope or imagine. And you can love just like that. We all should be bringing someone and helping someone get closer to Jesus, even if it's in some small way. Taking a meal helps somebody know there's a Jesus out there. Praying for somebody helps them know there's a Jesus out there. Giving them a ride somewhere when it's inconvenient helps them know Jesus is alive. 